Um, thank you. I know this is late in the day, so I'm going to try to be lively and get us engaged. Um, so it's always nice to come after Jeremy. This is a figure from one of his papers that I love. And so um, just to sort of get us all on the same page. So, uh, you know, autism is diagnosed on the basis of these two core behavioral features, but there are a variety of comorbidities that are associated with autism that makes it clinically heterogeneous and very difficult to model. Um, in, in animals, and I was tasked with speaking maybe a bit about my research, but talking more specifically about how we create animal models and how we evaluate them um, for streamlined translation and clinical impact for patients. And so, um, you know, currently um, autism is based on phenomenology, so signs, symptoms, course of illness, because the biological basis of autism is still poorly understood, um, and so we don't have any FDA-approved laboratory tests. We have behavioral, uh, behavioral therapies, two FDA-approved drugs that treat associated symptoms, but zero drugs that treat um, core features. Um, but what I want to say early in the talk is this lack of medication options for autism stems from a drug development crisis in central nervous system drug development more generally. So we know that over 90% of drugs that are developed for brain disorders fail in clinical trials. Greater than 50% of those failures can be attributed to poorly selected animal models. I've seen upwards of 80%. Um, and so we urgently need better animal models. The question is, what does better mean? Um, but this also provides an opportunity to think strategically about how do we develop these models. Um, and so I've developed a lot of animal models for different disorders, and so I think these are the, the key criteria that we need to think about generally. So we, um, we need to think about the onset. So for autism, it's neurodevelopmental. If we're thinking about dementia, we want to see the, the phenotype emerge in adulthood. If we're thinking about prevalence, autism is male-biased in prevalence. Depression is female-biased in prevalence. Um, we want to think about how we are going to model symptoms. Are we going to think about um, recapitulating the illness completely in an animal, like diabetes, for instance? Or are we going to say we think it's very unlikely for a brain disorder that an animal model would ha have a shared disorder or disease, so we're only going to model a piece of it, right? So that's a decision we need to make very early on. We need to think about things like face validity. So things like the behavioral features that we see in the animal model, are those shared with the, um, the symptoms we're interested in in the patients? We need to think about construct validity. Is the biological basis the same in the animal model and in people? Um, we also want to think about predictive validity. So if we have a drug compound, does the animal model allow us to identify and evaluate the drug's safety as well as its effectiveness? Um, we also want to think about welfare. So if we're thinking about social impairments, if you put an animal under really impoverished laboratory conditions, you might see social behaviors and repetitive um, behaviors, but those aren't going to be caused potentially by the genetic basis, right? This is going to be an environmental compound. And so then um, another thing I think we should address early on is these common mistakes that are made out of the gates where any really sophisticated animal modeler will tell you that somebody just threw their money away, right? Because they didn't think about these really important um, issues that um, drive translational failure. So one would be ignoring construct validity. And so I'm a primate, I'm, I'm a trans primate researcher. I do work in monkeys, I do work in people. And so there's been a lot of work early on to model autism in peer rearing, which is animals that were taken from their moms, put in a cage together, and they reared each other. But that's not how autism, that's not the, the ideological basis of autism. It's probably a better model for Romanian orphans, right? Um, we, we also, so we might want to think instead about spontaneously occurring social impairments or genetically engineered ones, right? So we can have induced models or spontaneous models. Um, also ignoring face validity. So if we think about autism, it's a complex brain disorder, a disorder of early life onset. It occurs in a highly social species that is diurnal, sleep consolidating, and uses vision as its primary sensory modality. These are really key things we need to think about if we're going to be looking at um, behavioral readouts in an animal model that we think that can then translate to patients. 
Um, there's also been a long history of treating neurotypical animals without having um, something that would be of interest. So I'll give you a good example. So there was um, work that was done giving oxytocin to these BTBR mice. They didn't have an oxytocin signaling deficit and you saw no movement at all in terms of behavior. But if you go in and you look at Fragile X mice, Magile 2 mice, Catnap 2 mice, they have an oxytocin deficit that can be rescued with oxytocin treatment, right? So thinking about what animal model you want to use can really critically drive how um, successful translation is. Um, and then another um, thing is using canned tests that are off the shelf because it's easy, especially if they're highly automated. It's really easy to run your animal through them, but the problem is that people use those same tests and they say, I'm measuring, I'm, this is a test for dementia, but this is a test for bipolar, this is a test for whatever, and the tests need to be very specific and designed to model the symptoms we think about in patients. And so, if, and one thing I want to say early on in the talk is that all models have value. You just have to leverage the model for what you're interested in. And so if we think about, you know, the cost, rodents are the clear winner if we're putting them, just opposing them to primates. But then there's other things we need to think about, like placental biology. That's really different in a rodent than in a primate, right? Um, development, right? You know, primates have a, one baby, but the development is really long and really expensive. But if you're thinking about modeling attachment for a disorder, not necessarily autism, but initially rodents attach to a nest site, not to their litter, right? So you need to think deeply about the ecology of the species and how you can, what pieces of it matter, right? And so as we were thinking, I did want to mention one thing about drug testing. So if we're thinking about drug testing, we need to make sure that the model organism has the same metabolic profile as people, right? And so. There were um, you know, instances of a, a designer heroin that was on the street that induces Parkinsonian-like features, right? And um, it was called MT MPTP. Rodents were refractory to that, right? But when you put it into primates, you could actually see the, this Parkinsonian phenotype. The same thing happened with um, thalidomide, right? Which was a morning sickness drug. Um, that was rolled out in Europe, not in the US, and it was only tested in rodents. And so then they put it on the market, and there were um, the women who took it while they were pregnant, their babies had um, really profound birth defects. When they back, went back and tested the drug in primate models, new and old world monkeys showed that phenotype. So we need to think really carefully about what models we want to use to ask which questions. And so in our own work, we've been doing primate work because we were interested in the things here that I've highlighted. Um, so if we think about, we also need to think about points of entry for model development, right? And so I'm using this slide from um, Jeremy's paper here. And so autism is, there's really, um, there's a, a large number of autism susceptibility genes, some that are monogenic and highly penetrant, right? And so you could have a genes first approach where you would actually look at a specific gene that you would induce in, um, um, in your animal model. Um, you could screen for homologous pathogenic variants in a very large colony. You could do selective breeding, right? So those would be all examples of a genetics first approach. You could also do a behavior first approach when you screen a colony for the presence of a spontaneously occurring behavior and then begin your animal model that way. Or you could do something like biomarker discovery and translation, which is also um, a feature of construct validity, right? Can you see the shared biology with your animal model and your patient. And so, um, and you can do these kind of in any order. And I'll tell you a little bit about the work that we've done. We adopted a behavior first approach and I'll walk through why this was the case for autism. So um, when you look at autism, a lot of, um, there's a lot of, um, discussion of these highly penetrant single gene mutations, but the vast majority of genetic burden in, aut is in autism is polygenic inherited. And I was really interested in how we might see that this polygenic inherited autistic trait burden is continuously distributed across the general population, which has been documented in some work um, that was done by John Capitano and um, with the SRS and Simon Baron Cohen has done similar work with the AQ in the, in the UK. And so what we were really interested in doing was developing methods to identify and study individuals at the quantitative extreme of a large monkey population. Um, and I'm particularly interested in social behavior. And so I'll tell you a little bit about the work we've done and how we've gone about validating our work. 
Um, so what we did was, this is, this is um, data from, and this is one of our measures. So there's a measure called the SRS, um, and you can target people at the end of this extreme in the general population. This is a distribution of the macaque social responsiveness scale where you can study monkeys at the extreme here. And then what we did is we did, um, we've done some biomarker discovery work, which I'll, I'll talk to you about, and then we've um, translated this work to patients um, in addition to a first-in-class drug trial, which I'll sort of finish with. Um, and so the work that we did was, um, we could have looked at a lot of different monkey species. We decided to look at rhesus monkeys, which are one of the closer relatives of humans that are um, that are, have been well studied. Um, they're highly social, so if we think back to some of the validity criterion that I mentioned earlier, they're highly social, they show complex social cognitive abilities, vision is their primary sensory modality. We already knew from past work that they show stable individual differences in social behavior, um, and we know from past work that they had naturally occurring social impairments. We just needed to figure out who these monkeys were in this population. Um, and so I, I always joke Stanford wouldn't let me have thousands of monkeys on campus, and so I had to take the show on the road, and that was up to UC Davis, where there's one of um, the seven um, national primate research centers, which is funded by the NIH, and there's over 4,000 rhesus monkeys there. Um, they live in these large outdoor half-acre corrals. Um, they can be brought indoors to, to study them experimentally, um, and they are, because they're such a large cohort, that would allow us to identify animals at the extreme. Um, and um, they also are housed not dissimilarly to how you would see them in the wild, right? And so they're highly enriched. Um, and then we were all also able to, because they're breeding colonies, we could study infants up into adulthood. Um, and so then what we did is we set out to, I did, to develop be, um, ways to identify these animals in this large population. And so this is a form of convergent validity. I wanted to show that we could do this in multiple ways and that these measures were all intercorrelated. And so we've done this in three different ways. One was through focal, like brute force focal animal sampling where you can see people on my team outside observing these animals. Um, and and they're, they're basically doing eat the gram scoring for the rhesus macaque um, behavior. Um, we also um, modified the social responsiveness scale and revised it, and this is a, um, a questionnaire that's used to look at um, quantitative social traits or autistic traits in the general human population, but it can also be used as a, as a screener for referral for clinical diagnosis. And so we reverse translated that and validated that in macaques. Um, and then we developed a, a variety of very sensitive behavioral tests in, in conversation with multiple clinicians over what they would like to see us be able to show in our animal model. All of these are highly intercorrelated, which um, shows something called convergent validity, right? They all measure the same sort of construct. Um, and then what I'll be doing is talking to you a bit about these um, naturally low social monkeys, okay, going forward. And so what we wanted to do was to establish face validity in this model. And so I'm gonna go through I don't know, a decade worth of work very quickly. So we know that these low social monkeys have a greater burden of autistic-like traits. We know that when we give them tests, um, in, we bring them in and we administer tests to them, that they show abnormalities in species-typical perception and reaction to social stimuli. They show face recognition deficits, but object recognition has been spared. Um, we can observe them unobtrusively in the home corral, and they show impairments in reciprocal social interactions, which is a, a core feature of autism, which is in this species is diminished affiliation and grooming. Interestingly, they show decreased initiation but not receipt of prosocial behavior. So it really looks, at least from this preliminary um, view, that they may have impairments in social motivation. Um, we've done medical record reviews to see if there are any comorbidities in our monkey population that are similar to what you see in people with autism. Um, we've been able to show that very early in life we can um, see subtle social information processing um, deficits that are 100% predictor, 100% uh, predictive of being low social later in life. Um, and then recently we were able to show that this phenotype is highly heritable. 
So what we decided to do once we'd established phase validity is we were really interested in looking in both cerebral spinal fluid and blood. And I was particularly interested in cerebral spinal fluid because it's a fluid that bathes the brain and spinal column and has been immensely useful for biomarker discovery in neurological disease. And so what we did is we've done um, hypothesis-dependent and independent work. I'll focus here on the, the de hypothesis-dependent work. And we looked in a variety of different pathways that had either been implicated in mammalian social functioning, in syndromes associated with autism, or even in idiopathic autism. And what we were able to show is just knowing what we had measured, this is a discriminant analysis, with 93% 93 uh, accuracy, we could collect, correctly classify animals if they were high, if they were socially competent or had this low social profile. And then um, given the, the talk length, I'm going to skip over all of the, the biomarker statistical funneling work we, went, uh, we did, but I'm going to give you the take home answer, which was that the key driver of classification was vasopressin levels in spinal fluid. And, um, and I'm going to walk you through this because we have the same graphs in people and in monkeys. So this is 50% correct classification. Um, and this is the probability of being low social, and this is the probability of being high social. And what you can see is that all of the monkeys, so this is a machine learning algorithm, and that most of the monkeys with low vasopressin were correctly classified here. And we do see this group difference. Um, we saw that there was a um, correlation between um, vasopressin and time spent in social grooming, which is a critical behavior in a lot of monkey species for establishing social bonds. Um, and then what we found is that if you think that you have a biomarker, you want to show that you have test retest reliability. So these are individual monkeys. You can see there's a very large range of vasopressin, but that each individual monkey has a very tight range of what um, vasopressin we see in these repeated measurements. Um, and then some other validation we did. So what was interesting is that vasopressin regulates um, pro-social behavior in male mam mammals. And so, you know, it sort of brings up the sense of potential sex vulnerability. Um, we've replicated this in multiple independent monkey cohorts. We've seen the group differences that are brain specific because we don't see a difference in blood. Um, and we've seen no differences in a structurally related peptide called oxytocin. It only differs by two amino acids. So we know there's specificity to a marker of mammalian social behavior that's specific to vasopressin and doesn't include oxytocin. Um, and then, um, and then, you know, one of the questions you always get when you have an animal model is, well, does this translate? Who cares? Does this tell us anything about people with autism? And so, you know, whenever we'd submit grants, people would say low sociality is a non, it's, it's not pathological, right? We don't, what does this mean? And so I, um, I teamed up with a bunch of different clinicians. We couldn't get any of this work funded. I should say that the most impactful work I've ever done has been funded through philanthropy. Um, and so what we did is we did this sort of poor man's multi-site study where we piggybacked onto clinical indication in our initial study to get um, kids that were undergoing uh, spinal fluid collection for standard of care who either had autism or did not have autism. And the people that did not have autism were rule out negative, as were the people with autism for the condition that they were being um, assessed for. And so in our first study, um, what we showed, and this is a very small sample, so seven children with autism, seven without, but what you can see is just knowing the CSF vasopressin concentration allowed us to um, pretty accurately classify individuals. And then um, I was fortunate to team up with um, Sue Suido at the NIH, who was collecting spinal fluid as part of a study she was looking at for immune parameters and folate deficiencies. So children with autism were undergoing a research lumbar puncture so that they were not ill and this was not a standard of care procedure. And what we were able to do is to, to um, not only replicate this finding, um, we were able to extend it to females with autism for the first time. Um, and because these were such well-characterized participants, we were able to show that the lower the CSF vasopressin level, the greater the symptom severity in these patients. Um, and again, um, oh, and what was interesting is this was specific to the social domain, suggesting that other pathways could be used in algorithm to sort of potentially also predict the restricted repetitive um, features of autism. And then what I want to point out is that oxytocin has become one of our controls because we saw absolutely no differences in CSF oxytocin levels here. 
Um, and then we've done some follow-up work in children with autism and neurotypical controls showing that there were no differences in blood vasopressin levels like in the multiple cohorts of monkeys. Um, and so these findings are very specific to the, the spinal fluid. So if we had not looked in CSF, we would never have found this. Okay, and then I was really interested in um, vasopressin is not an autism susceptibility gene, right? And so I've always thought that maybe vasopressin is this final common pathway that these autism susceptibility genes converge onto. And so maybe it's possible that, you know, vasopressin, that these deficits are present even before we see symptom onset. And so in 2010, I had met John Constantino, um, who's an autism clinician at an, ins an INSAR meeting, and I found out that he had squirreled away all this infant CSF in his closet, uh, in, in, sorry, in his, in his, <laughs> in his freezer, um, not in his closet. And I said to him, John, I have this like crazy idea, can I access your CSF? And he said, well, I'm really intrigued, but like go publish a bunch of papers. So I came back to him, I don't know, five or six years later, maybe even longer, and I showed them to him, and he said, okay, I'm ready to send you my samples now. And it was kind of a Hail Mary, but it was like a really fun study we did together and so he had 2,000 samples that were pre-electronic medical records that we were able to trace 900 of them into an electronic medical record system. And then we were able to ask of these kids in this quasi-prospective way, did, um, who went on to receive an autism diagnosis and who did not? And we followed them out to 12 years of age. And what was really remarkable is in these children who were um, being assessed at you know, zero to three months of age, that we already saw this vasopressin deficiency in these neonatal infants. And this was specific to vasopressin because we did not see it for oxytocin. And so I think there's a lot of really interesting things we could talk about here, but that's not why I'm here to talk. So we're gonna talk a bit more about the model. So, you know, for me, we had this model that, um, you know, so we showed that low CSF vasopressin was a robust transprimate biomarker of social impairment. We showed that um, this suggests that vasopressin signaling may be impaired in the brains of children with autism. We know that the vasopressin B1A receptor is densely distributed throughout the primate social brain, suggesting that if we were able to achieve brain penetration, we'd be targeting the areas we might care about. Um, and we know from work that we've done and others have done that vasopressin um, penetrates the CSF. And at least in our low social monkeys that have low CSF vasopressin levels, if we give them vasopressin, it actually rescues their social phenotype. And so this made us wonder what happens if we give vasopressin to children with autism. Nobody had done this before. And so I teamed up with Antonio Hardin, who's a child psychiatrist at Stanford and an autism clinician, and we did a pilot trial uh, that was double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled. This is published, I'm gonna kind of blow through it so we can have a discussion. Um, so we were really interested in the safety and tolerability of this, it was four weeks of treatment um, using these gold standard outcome measures. Um, and then we also wanted to know, and this was, we picked the SRS, this is what the FDA wanted us to use, but what I wanted to do is, you know, thinking back to the rhesus monkey work, I wanted to establish convergent validity. I wanted to see the blinded parents show progress, the blinded clinician, and the children themselves, right? So you wanna see all these measures converge and uh, show similarities. Um, and so we didn't see, uh, no one dropped out of the trial, there were no differences in adverse events. There were no significant changes on any of these parameters. Um, again, this is all published. Um, but what was really exciting is when we looked at these different measures, we saw um, improvement in social abilities by blinded parent rating, blinded clinician impression, and blinded child performance on laboratory computer-based tests, suggesting that we were, um, and again, this was four weeks, um, and it was a pilot trial, but this really suggested that this medication could hold promise for um, potentially treating a core feature of autism. And so then what I want to do is sort of outline what a translational research roadmap looked like in my lab, and then we'll conclude and we can talk if we have time. Um, so we developed this, this model and we validated it extensively. Um, we identified this, um, this pathway of interest. We confirmed, and I want to say this is one thing that if more preclinical researchers were committed to translating the work they did in their animal model, they would be far more careful in how they did their animal research. And so we confirmed it with um, in patients. We launched a successful first-in-class trial. We're now just completing a um, single-site 
um, phase 2B trial with uh, over 100 children with autism to replicate and hopefully extend this finding. The readout should be in spring or summer. Um, and then we discovered this biomarker before symptoms emerge. Um, and then what we have funding from the Brain Foundation to do is in our banked um, CSF and blood samples to try to create a biomarker panel to detect ri um, autism risk in targets. Um, and then what I'd really like to do is be able to treat these at-risk infants with vasopressin to see if we can change their developmental trajectories. Um, and then we've been banking cells from our clinical trial, and I would, um, one of our future goals would be, assuming that we have a positive readout in this second phase two study, would be to actually start looking at um, stem cells and um, differentiating them into neurons to ask if we can recapitulate treatment response and non-response. Um, and then I just want to close with some, some, some sort of thoughts about animal models. So, I mean, we've talked a bit about the key criteria for developing valid animal models, pros and cons of different animal models, um, common mistakes that drive translational failure, um, points of entry for ASD model development and validation, um, and we talked a bit about this, you know, this forward and reverse translation in monkeys and in kids with autism. I, I strongly believe that committing to involvement in the translational process holds investigators accountable for the models they develop. Um, and I also want to say that this sort of translational roadmap can be leveraged for any other feature of autism or any other comorbidity that people could care about, but really thinking deeply about how do you validate the model, and if you're going in, then how do we think about pushing it forward into patients, I think is the way that we're really going to make progress. And then I just want to conclude, it always takes a village, so I want to single out some of the collaborators, mentees, the RAs and techs, patients and families, and then all of our funding, particularly the Brain Foundation. It's so lovely to be here, and then you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Do we have questions? <laughs>